Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, so I just thought it would be fun. I see, as you can see I've got my own channel up here. Um, I'm gonna do. I haven't done a video in forever, and there's like eight million excuses I have for that. But you know how it is. Um, I thought it would be fun to come on here and read replies on my old Christian Marxism Explained video, which. I guess this Q Gospel video now has more views, but for a while this was the only video I had that like got a good amount of views, and it's still the only one that's gotten a lot of comments and like engagement. I haven't looked at any of that shit <laughs> in a long time, um, but I figured I could fucking just squeeze a little content out by just going on here and looking at these comments that I haven't looked at in a really long time. I've already replied to a lot of them in the comments, but... Maybe my uh, my views have uh, have opened up a little or changed a little or maybe I can be a little smarter about it now. So let's let's just do this. Um, sort by newest. I think as time has gone on, more comments on this video have been more of the negative comments. Like the positive ones all kind of happened at first, and then since then it's been uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Deus Volt, ew. Some kind, of, some kind of fascist or something. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through these and look at the kind of critical negative comments that I'm going to try to be... Um, I'm going to respond to them just kind of off the cuff. I have not planned this out. I have not looked at most of these comments in a long time, even though I've, you know, I get notified, so I've probably seen most of them. But, all right. Your Christian Marxism is missing... Oh, my God. Okay. Making people type paragraphs. Missing one essential element, the meaning of the physical resurrection of Jesus. It was a physical resurrection, but Jesus was not a materialist, and yet he was also not a transcendental spiritualist. The meaning of the resurrection is a dialectical fusion of the spiritual and the material into a new reality. Heaven and earth are united into the new reality of the kingdom. The kingdom is a non-entropic and immortal reality. I will come back to this. Okay. This dude's getting ready for uh, write his thesis on this YouTube video. The problem with purely materialist Marxism is the more... Okay, I did not mean to start this off with such a long... We're going to skip this one for now, and then we're going to come back to it, maybe, because it, it's... I appreciate that they're trying here. Um, okay. You are a fool. Yes, I am. Wow, you might call yourself a Christian, but you may not have a relationship with him. I'm assuming that means Jesus or God. So look at everything through the outside lens like this. To you, empty. To you, I don't know what that is. To you, it's useful like a pencil is useful. You don't get it. Um, okay. I think that there is a bit of a fair critique beneath this comment here. Um, and that's, you know, that, that I see Christianity as a tool. It's just something useful. I don't have a sincere conviction about it. It's like any other tool or, you know, like a pencil, whatever. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things where I, I nothing I could say is going to convince someone like this that that's not how I, you know, that's not how I feel, because to them it looks like that. But, um, I, I may not have, so I want to focus on this one. I may not have, I, I think that I do have a relationship with Jesus. Um, it's different for me to say I have a relationship with God because I still hold to a form of Christian atheism. So God is a little trickier, but um, I have a relationship with Jesus in the sense that um, I, I think about him every day for big portions of every day. Uh, I, he's a huge figure in, in my life and in the way I think and in the way I approach things. And it's, I will grant that that's not the same as like what most, I don't know about most, but a lot of Christians would mean when they say a relationship with him. Um, because to them, he... And I know this because I used to feel this way, and I have family members who feel this way, but to them, he is a living presence. That's how they see it. And to me, it's a little bit different. I, I have a relationship with 
with his memory, but more importantly with his legacy, I would say. Um, I, I think that Jesus really is, and you're just going to have to take my word for it, but despite me having a very unorthodox view of who Jesus was to a lot of Christians, um, Jesus is and probably always will be the center point of my life. And um, it's not just that he's useful, a useful tool for revolution, or that Christianity, I think, is something useful that that revolutionaries can just use, although I do think that. Um, I came to this position, to my Marxist Christianity, after a long, long personal spiritual journey in which I wrestled with questions of what I believe and, you know, what role faith has in my life. So it's not just something I seized upon because I thought it was useful. You know, that. <clears throat> Jehovah, okay. Uh, okay. Oh my, oh my, okay. We're not, we're not doing all that. Um, I just want to say that Jehovah, uh, the name of God in the Hebrew Bible, God has several names in there, and I apologize to my Jewish friends for this, because it's not something you generally say normally um, out of respect, but Yahweh, the reason... Um, that Yahweh W, I'm sorry, Y H W H is kind of the, is because that's as far as, you know, that's, that's as close of a transliteration as we can get, um, between the, the Tetragrammaton or what, however you say it. It's another one of those words I, I never say. I just read, so I'm, I'm blanking on how to pronounce it the right way, but, um, Jehovah is, is not correct. Uh, it's been a while since I've read up on like where the Jehovah mistransliteration comes from, but like the letter J did not exist back then, and, and I know Jesus, but Jesus would be Jesus or Yesu um, or Yeshua in in Hebrew or Aramaic. So um, Yahweh is the correct rendering of of the name of god it's not and they're like they're even yahweh appears in non-jewish uh like examples from ancient history um so yeah it's it's yahweh and like i don't really have anything against people using jehovah like jesus is not how we would have said his name but uh, or how people would have said his name back at the time. And I think it's fine to call him Jesus. And I think theoretically it's fine to use something like Jehovah, but like the people who use it are so dogmatic about it and don't, like they're not using it because it's become a common way to say it that's just in common usage. They're using it because they, you know, Je like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they just have a bunch of crazy beliefs and. And they're not interested in like why, why that's wrong or so. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna do all this. Sorry. I... Go. Ugh. We'll do a public debate sometime. Okay. Still waiting for the author of Mar Martin Carl. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Karl Marx. Real quotes against any organ. You're. You you okay? You're simply trying to prove your point without looking at the both reels. Okay. I think. I I don't know what this means. I think this person is saying they're waiting for me to address Karl Marx's quotes against organized religion. Which organized religion is not the same thing as religion. Just so you know. Um. Okay. I I don't. I can't parse this out, so we're going to move on. This is a very peaceful, diverse, and respectful comment section. 10 out of 10. Is it? Okay. Okay, I did reply to this one. I'm going to re respond to it. I replied to it probably six months ago, and I don't remember. I'll respond to it right now, just because I don't remember what I said, and then we'll look. Okay, Jesus is bourgeois in the sense that he's God and created everything, so he owns everything. Okay. Um... 
this is not a serious... Like, this person might have been being serious. I, I think this co count commented some nasty shit on other videos of mine, but I'm, I'm going to, like, take this a little too seriously for a second. Um, okay. Bourgeois, because he created everything, so he owns everything. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Right. This is, this is going to be between us, Mr. 5VA. Five, five the bourgeoisie don't create things. Okay, so I get that you're saying it's because he owns everything. But if he created it, he didn't own it because the bourgeoisie, by definition, don't create the things they own. That's the whole point. So this doesn't make sense. You don't know what bourgeois or bourgeoisie means. Uh, go, go back and do the reading. And it's certainly, yeah, that is certainly one way to approach it. It's a wrong way, but it's a way. Okay, here we go. Party camera. Oh, this is going to be a nice one. Um, I think I thumbs up. This is a nice comment, so we're not going to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, if your religion is communism, then it works. That being said, you can't be a Christian and a Marxist. Marxism replaces sin with class oppression, which is anti-religion. Is it? Hmm. Okay. Um, sin is not the central... If you go and read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, sin does not hold a central place in that gospel story the way it does in kind of popular Christian mythos. It's a little different for the Gospel of John, and, and I'm not saying sin isn't in there, because it is, but um, so I don't think that sin is central to Christianity the way that class oppression is to Marxism. Sin, if you study, you know, this is where Jesus being Jewish kind of is important. Um, ancient view, Jewish views of sin, and these are the, the views that Jesus would have grown up in. I, I don't, I don't want to say right now that he accepted wholesale, you know, the common Jew, Jewish views of sin, but this is the world that he grew up in and the context in which he would have understood sin. Sin uh, was less about individual um, like beliefs or motives or like... Um, sin was focused a bit more on... Um, like, the nation as a whole, or the Jewish people as a whole in a lot of ways. And it had a lot to do with, um, with class oppression, actually. Um, you can find tons of examples from the Hebrew Bible of sin being directly linked with class oppression in a lot of the prophets, and you can see it in, um, in, like, the Levitical Code or, or the Mosaic Law, where oppressive economic structures are described as sinful, not as sinful, but not literally described as sinful, but it's clear that oppressive economic practices were regarded as um, sinful or against the Mosaic Law. So um, I just want to say that I, I, I don't replace sin with class oppression, I think sin is a real thing if you define it as something that which is opposed to the will of God. Um, in my case, you know, even though I don't believe in a literal God, I believe in God as like a concept of ultimate goodness. So I think that there is a place for sin understood as class oppression. I don't replace sin with class oppression, I identify them with each other. And I understand that that's not going to convince you, Mr. Truth is, but I'm just, you know, clarifying. That's not what I do. And I, we're not going to read this stuff, but... Okay. Marxism is the precursor to socialism and communism. 
No, Marxism is a theory of socialism and communism. Socialism and communism is about control by the government. No, uh, communism has no government. Communism is the belief in a stateless society, partially, I mean, other things too, but, so by definition, communism, no government. Um, socialism is not about control by the government, it's about control by the working class, which in most Marxist formulations controls the government. So it's kind of uh, like through the transitive property, the working class controls the state, which controls the society. That's like the Leninist um, perspective on it. Okay. A man with a gun makes you comply with the government. Dude, that's how all government works. That's just government. That's not socialism or communism. That's just, that's what the state is. Sorry. Okay, once that grew on a foundation of Marxism that takes over, that means you answer to the government. I mean, yeah, in a world with no nuance, yeah, sure. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Okay. The, the government, okay, I see what he's doing. Jesus stands and knocks, but the government kicks the door in. Uh, the free gift of socialism is equal sharing of misery. Winston Churchill, who helped save us from Nazis. Winston Churchill was every bit as genocidal and racist as Adolf Hitler was. Um, the reason that a man like Churchill and a man like Hitler came into conflict is because they had competing imperial ambitions. Sorry, Winston Churchill was a piece of shit. Uh, yes, the gift of socialism is the equal sharing of misery. You know, um... I'm not going to get into, like, why overall socialist nations have been, or nations that have attempted socialism to varying degrees of success, have tended to be poorer, more immiserated, not miserable, but immiserated nations, but um, I would rather live in a world where everybody shares in misery than one where most people are in misery, but there's a few people that are disgustingly rich and prosperous. That's just me. <clears throat> Marxism leads to socialism about force. Christianity is about choice. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, show me the quote in the gospel where, like, Jesus says, I'm about choice. But regardless, this is actually a thing that I think uh, comes up a lot in like more libertarian socialist forms of Christianity or anarchist Christianity, there's this idea that Jesus was very like non-authoritarian and uh, like I don't really get how people can come to this view about Jesus because like Jesus is very clear that like in the traditional Christian formulation and I don't think that you know, the authentic historical Jesus said it in this way. But the the way that this comes to us in the Gospels is Jesus being like, dude, you follow me or you're fucked. You will be cast into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, it's not, it's like, like, yeah, I guess it's a choice, but it's a choice between getting on the side of the revolution or oblivion. So like, I guess that's a choice. Uh, um, you know, Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know, you you should uh, feed and clothe the least of these and welcome the strangers. You should do that stuff, but, you know, like, if you don't choose to do it, it's okay. To the people who don't choose to, to do that stuff, he says, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So, like... I mean, I guess, if you think that that's a choice, go nuts. I don't think it's a choice. Jesus was authoritarian, and you should be too. Oh, this guy wanted to, like, debate me. Uh, yeah, maybe. I like, okay. I'm a Muslim, and I love you, and I love Jesus as much as Moses and Muhammad. I believe Jesus' is second coming... Well, especially the U.S. will call him a lefty terrorist. That's true. If Jesus was around today, he would be 
uh, considered a terrorist, absolutely. Um, okay. I Thank you, dude. I love you. I'm not going to read all that right now. You must be Catholic. Protestant Christian sees a Marxist Christian as an oxymoron. This is really interesting to me because I'm not Catholic. I have never been Catholic. Uh, my... So, growing up, the, the barely any church experience that I had was in the UCC, which is a mainline Protestant denomination. I, I think my friend Charlie, if he sees this, might like correct me and be like, well, technically it's not mainline, but that's how I, I don't know. But it was the United Church of Christ, which is a Protestant denomination. And, um, like, even when I as like an older teenager and starting to become an adult wanting to wanting to get more into Christianity after my like 90% secular upbringing I still went back to the UCC and when I experimented only went to Protestant church I've never attended a Catholic service I've been to a Catholic funeral once but that's it um I will say that I am very attracted to Catholicism, like, in certain ways, but they also have so many of their own issues, and they're different issues than Protestant and especially evangelical denominations. So it's like, when, when you say Protestant Christians see Marxist Christian as an oxymoron, I get where you're coming from because most Marxist Christians have been Catholic. And it, it seems weird to a lot of, like, because the Protestant Protestantism is where all the, like, liberal Christianity is. And you would think that there'd be, like, an affinity between, like, a Marxist Christian and a, and a like, a liberal progressive Christian. And, like, there is to some degrees, and I was in, really, in that pr progressive Protestant Christian world for a little while, but, like, the most like mainstream uh christian scholar theologian that i was ever into was john dominic crossan who was a catholic priest um and then like you go and look at liberation theology is a very catholic aside from james cone and like black christianity which tends to skew more protestant but like in latin america there have been thousands or tens of thousands of Christian revolutionaries who have mostly been Catholic. There were, you know, there was even a famous Catholic priest named Camilo Torres who, uh, who joined his, the revolution and actually was killed in battle. Um, and he never like, like, uh, recanted from Catholicism or as far as I know, he was never, um, excommunicated or anything. He lived and died as a Catholic priest, guerrilla fighter, um, communist. So, um, I need to do a little more research into, and you know, even like the Catholic Church in the 70s, I have a paper I'm writing slowly, but the Catholic Church in the 70s even admitted similarities between the teachings of Mao Zedong and Jesus. So like, there is affinity between the Catholic Church and Marxism. I think the Catholic Church, were it not so fucking dominated by Europeans, would could like not like overnight but could be a real revolutionary force um so like if i had to choose between catholicism and protestantism i definitely would choose catholicism this person is like this ordo uh, whatever is like definitely just like a racist like if it was 60 years ago they would have been like oh fucking john f kennedy can't be president because he's a catholic um And like I like my like I know I have a relative who's very Protestant who like thinks Catholics aren't even Christians. So like I know that this is where this person is coming from. So I don't want to say they're right, but like they are kind of right. And it's I want to see more Protestants um, coming in. You know, like in, obviously I want to see everyone embracing Marxism, but I, I'd be curious to see why so few in like mainline protestantism even and the more liberal i mean that's kind of right there because they're liberal but i just wonder and i need to do more research into why catholics have tended to be more open to marxism and to revolution than even the most liberal of protestants 
Yeah, I think I just think that's really interesting. I don't know. You you would think, but I, I kind of left the. Uh, I left the, I don't consider myself Protestant at all, obviously. I, when I left the kind of, when I gave up on the UCC for the most part and and left the kind of progressive Christian uh, scene, I was attracted to Catholicism, but no, I've never, like, I've never joined it and I, and I wouldn't convert to it or join it or be confirmed or anything like that um, without some more things changing. Okay, it's sad to see so called more research is James 3 1. <laughs> Jordan Peterson. <laughs> you know what? Let's do this. Let's go to James. Uh, I love James. Not many of you should become teachers. Okay, so this is just an insult. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Yeah, I thought this was going to be some kind of like exegesis or argument, but no, it's just saying that I shouldn't be a teacher because I'm wrong. Okay. Christianity will stand on its knees and be tortured to death like Christ, whereas a Marxist would start a revolution. Okay. I get your point. I myself am an authoritarian centrist. As long as it's peaceful, do you? There's no religion. What is an authoritarian centrist? Is it... Um, I don't, I don't even, I don't, I, I don't know what to make of that. Like you're authoritarian, but as long as it's peaceful, okay. Um, I don't think Christianity will stand on its knees and be tortured to death like Christ. This is where I lose a lot of those like main like progressive Christians that tend to be Protestant, this is where I lose them because I don't think that the historical Jesus knelt down and just passively accepted his death as a sacrifice for mankind. Um, I think <sighs> Revelation depicts an avenging Christ who returns and like very violently destroys and kills the oppressors of mankind, of humankind. So, and obviously there's, that's a can of worms because it does, it has been used and still is used by a lot of reactionary Christians to justify violence. And so I, I know that it's something that needs to be approached very carefully, but this kind of passive just acceptance and nonviolence that seems to a lot of Christians, especially liberal Christians, like it's baked into the DNA of Christianity. I don't agree with that, and I don't see that. And this is where, much as I love him and as he, as he and his theology and his scholarship was formative for me, this is where I really disagree with John Dominic Crossan on Jesus, because... You know, I, I think he would agree with this Christianity will stand on its knees and be tortured to death. Um, I don't, that's not the Jesus I, I see when I read the gospel, and that's not the Jesus that I think is the liberator of humankind. So, lol. It's like you haven't even really read the Bible. <laughs> I remember what I said to this lady, but like, nah, dude, I, I've read... I've read the Bible more than, like, 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet, and, like, I would stake my life on that fact being true. I've read, I have not read the entire thing front to back. I've read the vast majority of it, and I have read the entire New Testament front to back numerous times. Um, there's, like, some of the Apocrypha I haven't read, and I'll be real, I, like, I skipped through a lot of numbers because it's, it's just, it's numbered. Um, and I think I, I didn't read all of, like, the King's books, um, but I have read, like, most of the Bible more than once, uh, yeah, so, I do read the Bible, I just don't read it the same way as you, sorry. Unfortunately, this is unbiblical for many reasons. Jesus said the poor will always be among you. Did he? Did he say that? Mm -hmm. Um, oh god, okay, here we go. 
when Jesus said the last will be first and the first shall be last, he was talking about the resurrection of the saints. No, he wasn't. I mean, yes, it's been interpreted that way in several times, but that phrasing comes in numerous contexts, contexts, plural, within the gospel account. I mean, you know, this, this is nothing I can, like, argue against Christian dogma by just quoting, like, a uh, critical scholarly approach to the historical Jesus. It doesn't work that way for most people. Um, but I, I think that this person is, like, correct in a weird way, that this is unbiblical. But here's the thing, is that, like, biblical, something being biblical is a very fraught and misleading phrase because the Bible is self-contradictory. It's not, it's not a unified text. And, like, I, I get that most Christians just don't care that I say that, but, like, if you treat it like what it is which is a collection of works written by human beings, and even if you want to say they were divinely inspired, they were still fallible human beings who wrote these things and did not intend for them to become holy scripture and to be read as, like, one single book. So the Bible is self-contradictory. So something that is, like, unbiblical... You can make anything unbiblical. The Bible is so long and was written over the course of so many hundreds of years, I guarantee you, you can find something in there to, like condemn almost any belief you want. So everything is unbiblical in a way. Um, I think that, you know, I get, a, you know, people who take my view that we get accused of like cherry picking the Bible, which I'm actually okay with. People be like, you're just cherry picking the Bible. And like, yes, I am. Um, and I think you have to. And I think everyone does. Everyone cherry picks the Bible because it contradicts itself. And, of course, you can twist yourself into pretzels doing all these, you know, these really uh, fucking complicated exegesis of different passages to explain why it's not contradictory and to resolve those contradictions. And sometimes it, it works better than other times. But, like, um, that doesn't mean that that's what was intended when it was written. And I do believe that what was intended when it was written does matter to an extent. It's not, it's not just what you can make out of it today. It's also what it meant at the time. That's how I see it. You're eloquent, but just wrong. Thank you. I appreciate that. Christianity and Marxism are incompatible. I mean... <laughs> Okay, okay. Christianity and Marxism are incompatible. I disagree. Marx was a racist. Yes, he was. And in favor of ethnocide. No. <laughs> Marxism is theft. Blah, blah, blah. Not very Christian. Blah, 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 blah. I might be a socialist, but I doubt he's a Marxist. Um... Marxism is a living tradition, much like Christianity. Uh, there are lots of people who call themselves Marxists and are called Marxists and probably, you know, could be considered, you know, even I would call them Marxists that I disagree with on many, many things. So. All right, this person is a Marxist first. Is a, I'm definitely a Marxist, but I'm a Christian first. Now, this is a nice person, the person is, I remember this, but this comment now, supernatural, okay, I'm not, I don't believe in the supernatural, it's fine if you do, if it doesn't, like, lead you to do bad things, that's my take on it, like, I don't care if you believe in supernatural stuff, as long as you're not, like, doing fucking reactionary shit from that belief, and I think that those beliefs can and often do lead people to hold reactionary beliefs, um, and that's an issue, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it's worth my time to convince people not to believe in supernatural stuff. But I want to address this. I'm a Marxist, but I'm a Christian first. I know a lot of people like this. And it, it sounds good. And, like, I get it. I'm not going to, I was a Christian 
first before I was a Marxist too. And I often say how Christianity and Jesus led me to Marxism. However, I would not say anymore that I'm a Christian first and a Marxist second. I, For me, they are completely dialectically intertwined. And, um, like, because I stopped being a Christian for a while and then I had to really redefine what that means for me before I could call be comfortable calling myself a Christian again. And that happened around the same time I came to Marxism and socialism. So for me, I can't say one has primacy over the other. They're very intertwined in my, in my beliefs. Um, I think that Marxism really helps me understand Christianity in a lot of ways. It really opened up Christianity and Jesus for me. And at the same time, um, I think my faith and my, my passion for Jesus makes me a better Marxist. Um, it, it helps make sure that I, I don't fall into a lot of the stupid traps that a lot of Mar Marxists fall into, the dogmatism and the disconnection from the masses and the, like, weird fucking workerism and, like, social chauvinism that a lot of white Marxists fall into. I think that Christianity helps me avoid a lot of those traps, so I can't say I'm one more than the other can't be a cat and a mouse at the same time. Um, this person wants Christianity and Marxism. This person, Ch Chapo. <laughs> I wonder if they're affiliated with Chapo Trap House. Oh god, woke parenting needs to be stopped. Okay. Um, okay, you can't be a cat and a mouse at the same time. So, this person wants Christianity to be, like, positioned as the like, the nemesis of Marxism. I, I bet this person believes in cultural Marxism as, as like, a theory. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Like, Marxism is opposed to capitalism, not Christianity. Christianity's been around a lot longer than capitalism. So, yeah. This is blasphemy. <laughs> Thank you. You're a useful idiot. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. We have natural right that communism is completely opposite. Uh, I'm not gonna address that right now because it's I don't natural rights. So I I'm not like yeah. All rich people aren't evil, but they're more tempted to do evil things because they have superfluous amounts of money. I disagree with this. I think all rich people are evil, and it's because and this this is like again this is a very Jewish view. Evil is not like a belief in your heart. And this is also, I think, a very materialist view. Um, I don't think people are evil because of what ideas exist in their head. People are evil based on what they do. And rich people, by definition, exploit the masses of human society. That's the only way to get rich in the world. I mean, like, you, there's, like, certain maybe celebrities or something, and obviously rich is not, like, a super helpful term because, you know, what's rich nowadays? But, I mean, in general, if we... if we, I don't want to say all rich people and define it by, like, your fucking net worth, but, like, all rich people, meaning if, if we change that to all like, bourgeois people are all exploitative people, all people who own the means of production, and all people who make their living through exploiting other people's labor, they are evil because what they do and the way that they make their living is evil. Um, okay, render unto Caesar, uh... That famous quote. It wasn't Jesus telling people to pay their taxes. He was preaching about how should we give to God's word of God. But so, like, yeah, I actually agree with you. I think that, like, I see this from like liberal and leftist Christians sometimes when they're like when they quote the render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and like, oh yeah, this means you should pay your taxes. And like, I think liberals do it to be like, you know, taxes are good. Let's raise taxes on rich people, which is. They mean well, but, like, this is wrong. Um, and this is, like, one of those things that's very contextual. So when Jesus is saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and 
God, what is God's? What he's saying is that, like, Caesar is not God. Caesar was considered a god, and even in a lot of the times Augustus Caesar was considered, around the time Jesus was alive, to be, like, the highest of the gods within the Roman pagan system. And so... You know, the, the Gospels present this story as Jesus being asked a trick question. It literally says, like, to trap him, they asked him this question about whether it's lawful to pay taxes. So you have to read this quote in that context. What Jesus is saying is like a way to get out of being trapped into saying, oh, no, don't pay your taxes, which could get him killed. Um, but it's also like a subtle way of differentiating between Caesar and God. So I agree with you, and what you're saying is that he's preaching how we should devote our lives to God. And devoting our lives to God means liberating the oppressed. That's what that means to me. Oh my god, you're going to fuck with James 5.1. I, I, how, do you, I just, how do you read rich people weep and howl for the miseries that are coming to you? It's not saying that rich people are evil. Duh. If you continue reading that scripture, you'll see that it's talking about the gluttonous and evil wealthy people. Yes, all of them. Not all rich people as a whole. Really? It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Forcing everyone to be there, we get this equally poor thing again. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure... When Jesus said in order to join him, you have to give away all your wealth, there is an assumption of equal poverty there. Jesus chose poverty. He left the life of a carpenter, which was still an impoverished life, to be clear, but he left the life of a, of a settled person with a day job and a trade that he probably grew up in um, to be intentionally poor, and he made his followers do the same. That's, you know, he didn't charge for his healing. So, yeah, forcing everyone to be equally poor is what Christ desired. He literally says that and shows it by his example. Hi, comrade, I'm Anarcho. What did I say to this person? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I It's, it's, it's too long to go into now, but, uh, Leftist Christians do tend to lean more anarchistic in my experience, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. And I have a lot of reasons why I think it's wrong, beyond just, like, the fact that I'm a Maoist, for example, and I don't believe in anarchism. Um, although I think that anarchism has important things to teach all revolutionaries, I just don't agree with it in principle. But beyond that, I also have reasons why I don't actually think it's the right the right interpretation for uh, Christianity. I touched on that earlier. You know, I think if you read it, it's pretty clear that Jesus was very authoritarian, and I don't use that word um, pejoratively. I, I'm authoritarian. I'm an authoritarian communist, and I don't make apologies for that, but I know that that word has a lot of negative connotations for people um, and it gets thrown around willy-nilly to describe, like, any strong leader. And I don't really mean it in that way. I just mean that I believe... Here's the thing. All politics is authoritarian. The existence of the state is authoritarian. And I know that, like, that's anarchists' point. But I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing to be authoritarian against reactionaries and oppressors. And then he goes... Mm. I replied to this person. Christ was a libertarian proto -mar. There we go with the libertarian thing. I just, I don't agree with that. Kingdom of God is a very deliberate um, term in, in at least Greek that implies a state of some sort. It implies a state, like a, a godly counterpart of, of the Roman Empire. So... You know, I don't, I don't think Jesus... I think if you tried to explain the concept of, like, a stateless society to Jesus, he would have been, like, like a little confused by that. Um, yeah. Or at least... I shouldn't say that. 
I think if you tried to explain the concept of like a voluntary society to Jesus, he would have been like a voluntarism, which to me, some anarchists might correct me on this, but, but I feel like anarchism doesn't work without voluntarism. And I, I think that's where Jesus would have been like, well, you can't, like, you gotta force these people to do the right thing. <laughs> okay, I'll do like one or two more. Uh, okay, the kingdom of God does not lie on earth. Jesus didn't, okay. Kingdom of God, the lot lie on earth. That's, uh, that comes from the Gospel of John. Uh, oh boy. I like the Gospel of John. I like reading it. It has some very beautiful language in it. It has beautiful, like, proverbs. I almost want to call them in it. Um, it has very little to do with what Jesus actually taught. It, it's best read as, um an interpretation, or, or it's best read to to kind of understand where Christianity was roughly 70, 80 years after Jesus died. Um, it's not central or even very relevant to how I understand Christ. I'm sorry. Um, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you. And... Uh, in many other places, in Mark and Matthew and Luke, he says the kingdom of God is drawing near. So yeah, that's that to me. And the nearness um, implies physical nearness, not like not just in time, but also in space. So it definitely um, supports and implies a worldly kingdom of God. I'm sorry, Jesus didn't promise that the last would be first, and that they would rule over anyone. I mean, you know. You can you can choose not to read it that way, but like I I gotta go with what it says. It's, it doesn't just <laughs> here's here's the thing. This is this is what like liberal Christians miss a lot, and like obviously this person too. Jesus didn't promise the last would be first and that they would rule over anyone. Yeah, he did because he didn't just promise that the last would be first. He also promised that the first would be last. It's not just, you know, oh, good things happening to the poor people, but it's also bad things happening to the to the wealthy and powerful people. They get put last. So, you know, that that's the thing that gets left off a lot. And that's, an, you know, right, you get it. The proletariat was a distinct social class that was produced in the past in the age of the first industrial revolution. And you cannot compare it to a social class in the Roman times just because the hierarchy they were at the bottom. The word proletariat comes from the Roman times. It's obviously not like a one-to-one -one comparison, like it's the same class and it had the same role because it didn't. But the proletariat did exist in Roman times. It was just a very small class of free wage laborers. I mean, it's identical. The experience of being proletarian and having your labor exploited was similar to, extremely similar to what it would be like in a capitalist economy or a capitalist mode of production. There were just far fewer of them and they weren't the revolutionary class. Obviously the slave class was because there were slave rebellions all over the place. Um, but that's just because there were uh, comparatively very few proletarian workers um, at, that, at that time because most of that kind of labor was done by slaves. Um, but it did exist. It was small. And the Gospels tell us that Jesus was one of them, believe it or not. Um, and then the proletariat no longer is. This is just a funny thing to me. I, I, like, you even hear this from, like, leftists and, like, some, some Marxists sometimes. Like, they think that because you're not working in a factory, you're not, like, working class anymore. I, um... So this comes from a, a misunderstanding of like what a commodity is. Uh, a commodity doesn't actually have to be like a physical product made in a factory. Although like th there are still things being made in factories by proletarian workers. Just most of them 
are in the third world right now, and like people like this, <laughs> like Sara Lee for some reason, don't don't like consider them to be real people because they're in the third world and they're working in sweatshops and they, they can't be the proletariat, I guess, for some reason. So the proletariat does exist. It's just largely not white and doesn't exist in the West as much. Um, but you know, like even in a mostly service driven economy, the people who have to sell uh, their labor power to the capitalist class are semi proletariat. And it could be argued, and, and I've seen it argued, that a lot of services um, produce value and create surplus value in the same way that like a physical commodity was, and, and they called it a service commodity. And I, I think that argument was pretty sound from what I remember. I haven't read it in a while, but like functionally, there's really no difference between selling your labor to make a car in a factory and selling your labor to fucking serve someone a meal at a restaurant. This overly narrow dogmatic definition of proletariat, like, oh, it, you know, it falls outside the bounds of the way Karl Marx explicitly described it, so therefore it doesn't exist anymore. That's just nonsense, because you have to look also at the role it fills within the economy and the experience of being that kind of worker. You know, if you still experience exploitation and alienation from the product of your labor, then, like, functionally, what's the difference? Okay. Okay. He preached the opposite, nonviolence and forgiveness. Did he? Are you sure about that? Are you sure? I know, turn the other cheek and whatnot, but uh, is it forgiving people to, um, when he said, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels? For I was hungry, and you did not feed me. I was thirsty, you did not give me a drink. I was sick, and you did not minister to me. I was in prison, you did not visit to me. Because you did not do those things for the least of these? Is that forgiveness? When he says, you'll go into the eternal fire. That's for, that's for, that's nonviolence. Okay, got it. That's eternal fire, nonviolence, and forgiveness. Okay. How many Marxists would truly forgive capitalists for the abuse of power? Uh, they shouldn't. Into the eternal fire with them. Go, shoo. Go get into the eternal fire, capitalists. I, I don't apologize for that. I think if someone's a capitalist and they, and they come to like a revolutionary understanding and accept the exploitative nature of what they do, they'll stop doing it. They will do what Jesus said and sell their possessions and give them to the poor and follow him. That's how you can be forgiven. Jesus gave those people an out. They can take it if they choose to. He would never endor endorse mass killings at the gulags. Probably not. No, you're right. Yeah. Jews thought of him as the leader who would lead them to convert for and he okay. Yes, Jesus thought of the Messiah. Jew I'm sorry, Jews believed the Messiah would be kind of like a an avenging, conquering king who would help them to uh, kick the imperialists out of their land. That is absolutely true. And the fact that Jesus didn't do that and didn't really seem interested in doing that is like one of the main things about the historical Jesus, why, why we can be pretty clear that Jesus did not claim himself to be the Messiah. Now, if you start from the position that obviously Jesus was the Messiah and then you work backwards and say, well, okay, all those Jews must have been wrong about what the Messiah would be because Jesus was the Messiah and he didn't fulfill those archetypes, so therefore uh, the archetypes were wrong. I do it differently. I don't presume that Jesus was the Messiah because I don't think there is any the Messiah. I think um, the Christ or the Messiah is a, it's a standard it's, it's kind of, it's a title that to me, you know, the essence of it is liberation, liberation of the Jewish people, liberation of God's people. So, um, for Jesus to be, for Jesus to be the Messiah or for Jesus to be called Christ in any meaningful way, he has to be 
the liberator of humankind. And I don't mean like in a literal sense, like he's going to come back and do it, but like his legacy has to be a legacy of inspiring people to, to, um, to create revolution, to liberate humankind. Um, so that's what I'm saying. When I say Jesus is Christ, that's how I mean it. And like this person isn't going to do it because again, they're starting from the position that like the standard face value Jesus of me of Christ of Christianity and you know read whatever their version of Christianity is that's who the Messiah is so uh yeah he appeared as a gentle guy to teach love and kindness for everyone. he he did appear to teach love and kindness and forgiveness and responsibility of one's soul but like not for everyone for the least of these for the last who will be first, for the blind and the crippled and the lame and the poor who are invited to the to the great banquet. That's who Jesus' message was to. It was not for everybody. It was exclusive to those people. Okay, I've gone on for a long time. I think this is a this was fun. I I don't know. I hope someone will get something out of it. Um thanks for being here. Yeah.